very much that introduction. Um, I just think I can see the Europe happening. It's been a big boss and fun about all the things I've done. But I think House in Europe is it's probably the thing that I've done and of which I'm the most proud. And I'd like to share some of that with you today. Um, so yes, the House in Europe, where I work, is the European Federation of Public Cooperative and Social Housing Providers. So we work on behalf of national and regional federations around Europe who try to provide various forms of affordable housing for people who need it. So I've been asked to speak to you today about a number of different issues, including some potential policy initiatives that we see in other European countries that could potentially be used uh, in, a, in a Welsh context. But specifically I've been asked to frame those within the overall conversation that you see here in Wales and that was discussed uh, by a number of speakers this morning and that's the issue of property speculation, the marketization, the financialization of, of residential property which leads to things like vacant uh, or unoccupied homes, it leads to gentrification, it leads to people not being able to live within their local communities because of increased competition from uh, buyers or people behaving in kind of speculative manners. So that's what I'm trying to talk about today. So at the, at the outset I'd like to set out a very simple idea and that is that we ought to think about housing not as a, as a, as a, a want but as a need. It's something that people fundamentally need in order to live well. So we ought to think about housing in the same way that we think about education or about healthcare. If someone said to you um, sorry, your child can't go to school because all the schools in the country are private and you don't have money, well that's tough luck, your child doesn't get education. Of course people would say that's ridiculous. So, but yet when we say, I'm sorry, this person is homeless, or this person can't afford to access uh, housing in their community at a price that they can afford, well that's just the market, tough luck. Why do we accept that? Why do we have one standard for education or for healthcare and a completely different standard when it comes to housing? Um, so I would like to get back towards a vision in Europe and Wales and everywhere else of the idea of housing as, as a fundamental need of all people, as an inalienable right, that is something that we should aspire to provide for people uh, as a basic necessity. So how do we get to the situation that we see today with the marketization of housing, where housing is treated more as a want as opposed to a need, and that we do see people being excluded uh, in increasing volumes of um, from the housing sector. So of course it wasn't always this case uh, in, in Europe and indeed elsewhere in the world and if you'll bear with me for a few minutes to give you a very short history lesson. Um, so of course in the post-World War II period we did have a very different conception of housing. We did have the idea of housing as what it effectively is. It's a place to live. It's part of the foundation for a good life and for, for good communities. So. One interesting statistic that I'll present to you this morning, which is from England, unfortunately not from Wales, um, but it's between 1946 and 1979, local councils in England built 4.1 million new homes. When you combine this with the largely charity operated housing association sector, social housing in England accounted for 51% of all new homes built in that period of time. 51%. The number of households living in social housing peaked in 1979 at just under 5.5 million, which was 31.2% of all the homes in England at that time. Now, 1979 was a very important year in British politics, as I'm sure you know. We already had Mrs. Thatcher vote this morning, and indeed that was a turning point in the mentality in this country, but also in other European countries that had a cascading effect of market liberalisation. So we moved away in Europe, and not every country, but in most countries, from the idea of housing as a basic need that ought to be provided for and guaranteed by, by the state, towards a more idea of every man for himself, the private market will prevail, the private market will see sense, it will drive greater efficiency, greater competition, and will all live more prosperous and healthy lives. Of course we see that that didn't really pan out very well. I won't evoke again, as was already mentioned this morning by Labon, about the long-term consequences of things like the right to buy and the impact you see of people today with very low incomes, living in former council owned houses, they're living in very poor quality homes because they can't afford the basic management and upkeep of those homes. Clearly, we've seen the folly of that policy and I'm very encouraged to know that Wales has brought an end to the right to buy, or at least certainly really curtailed the right to buy, uh, as has been the case in Scotland and indeed the case in Northern Ireland. Um, 
and I think your, your neighbours to the east have maybe not yet seen the light on that issue yet, but let's see. Um, but we, we did see a growing marketisation of housing, a growing liberalisation of housing in the 1990s, all across Europe, and indeed into the, into the 2000s. And of course that culminated, we know perfectly well, in what we saw in 2007, 2008, a huge global financial crisis that was largely off the back of huge speculation in the property sector, that led to bank bailouts, that led to people losing their homes, that led to huge wave of defaults, and basically we, the people, had to bail out the banks for their bad debt. So that showed the folly, that should have been a new birth for the idea of housing as a basic need and for publicly supported housing, but it wasn't. In fact, quite the opposite happened. We doubled down on the idea of market liberalisation. What we've seen in the intervening years since the global financial crisis was even more marketization of housing. We saw private entities coming in and buying up distressed assets and then squeezing people out of their homes by increasing rents to levels that they couldn't afford. Um, and So again, I try to keep the history lesson brief, but you know, uh, it's, it's, it's an always difficult. So it seems that we didn't really learn the lessons of the past. And even today, I've been speaking a lot in recent weeks about the, what we're currently seeing in the property sector across Europe. And that's the fact that we put so much faith into private developers, built around apartment providers and so on, to deliver the homes that we needed for people. Um, that now that interest rates are increasing again, the cost of building is increasing, bond deals are increasing, means investors have other places to park their money, we now see that right across Europe, the building of new residential properties has basically ground to a halt. If you look at Germany, for example, there's a huge crisis in Germany at the moment where basically construction has just ceased because the people who were building the homes have found better alternatives, other places to, to speculate, other places to put their money. So again, we have not learned the mistakes we, from our mistakes of the past, this putting the faith in the private sector to deliver the homes that are needed is simply a foolish policy that will never lead us to the situation where we need to be, where people have access to homes when they need them at affordable prices. So how do we find our way back to some kind of sanity on the housing question? Um, for me, again, I think we need to return to first principles. This means that housing should become, again, a basic need of all people, and we must move away from speculation and commodification of housing. But their words, what are the actions? How do we fundamentally get back to that, that state of more sane approach to housing? So what I'd like to do in the next few minutes, and to conclude my, my short presentation here today, is to give you just a, a very short, small taste of a number of housing policies that we've seen in other European countries that we know to be effective, that maybe could help to inspire uh, you in Wales in terms of your legislative endeavours on housing. Again, it's important to emphasise that there is no blueprint there is no one-size-fits-all model for how we make a good housing system. A housing system can only work within the historical, cultural uh, and financial governance context in which it finds itself. What works in Wales may not be appropriate for, for France, or for Italy, for Germany, or for Ireland, or from. You have to find something that works in a uniquely Welsh context, having Welsh solutions for Welsh problems. So what I'm about to outline to you here now is basically the mechanics of good housing policies. How they would actually work in a Welsh context, that's up to you. So the first one is on the issue of vacant housing. So we've heard a lot enough about vacant housing this morning. And indeed, it's a huge issue, not just in Wales, but right across the world. My colleagues and I in Housing Europe have recently completed a report on the issue of vacant housing, in which we tried to, on the one hand, get a handle on how many homes in Europe are actually vacant. Um, we heard from Chris this morning the, the, the appeal for good data. And that's something actually we don't have. I spoke at a conference on Tuesday for Habitat for Humanity, in which I said that in Ireland today there are five official government produced estimates from different public agencies about the quantity of vacant housing in Ireland. Five different estimates, and those five estimates vary widely in terms of the figures they actually produce. Uh, when I said that, some actually raised their hands and to say, no, 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 there's actually six estimates <laughs> of vacant housing in Ireland, and none of them agree. And of course, People who are against, for example, increased taxation or putting the pressure on the owners of vacant property always pick the lowest of those estimates to say, ah, but look, the cost of actually tackling the problem will be bigger than the, than the benefits it would deliver for society. So fundamentally, understanding the idea of vacant housing, that would be my big appeal to you. Really getting in there. There are great policies from around Europe. I would suggest that you look at the publication on our website to give you a lot more information. I think we have about 40 different policies that could be used to, to tackle vacant housing. 
You can pick the ones that work, that work best for you. Um, but the real key to making those policies work is fundamentally understanding why homes are vacant, which homes are vacant, and then finding the policy levers that work to bring them back into use for people who need them. The second thing we've heard a lot about this morning is the idea of community. How do we put community back into housing? And again, there are a number of different approaches. There's a CLT model, which of course is, is quite well established now in a number of European cities. In London, I vis visited a CLT project not so long ago that's quite, quite ambitious. In Brussels, where I'm based, again, we have quite a strong CLT movement, so I won't really dwell on that. But another approach is again, even though I work on behalf of primarily social housing providers, I also work on behalf of cooperative housing providers. Not everybody who currently can't access a home because they're priced out of the market or there's a lack of supply needs or wants to live in a rental property or a social housing property. That's a solution for many low-income people, but it's not the solution for everybody. So one approach would be to look at what they do in the Nordic countries, in the likes of Sweden, in the likes of Norway, where they have a huge emphasis on cooperative housing. People coming together as a community to meet their shared housing needs. In Sweden today, about one in every four homes is part of a cooperative housing movement. One in every four. And what that fundamentally means is that you take the, the mortgage um, potential of 30, 40 people, or, or households rather, to come together, pool their resources, and deliver new housing uh, for, for them and for their community. And what's really interesting about that approach is, of course, there's no law, there's no government that says who can be part of that property. It's up to you as a community to find the like minded individual, individuals to come together and make that new housing property. So you could, have a, you could have a housing cooperative where it's only for people who speak Welsh. You could have a housing cooperative where it's only for people who are older, or only for students, or only people with, with um, mobility issues. It's really up to you. That's, that's the great thing about cooperative housing. It's up to you to set the parameters. It's a very complicated model in terms of how it works in terms of financing. I know, of course, it's great to have the idea of building cooperative housing, but then how do you actually get it off the ground? Where does the money come from? So as I said, in the, in the Swedish system, pool the mortgage eligibility of 30 or 40 different households. You go to the commercial bank and say, look, us 30 people here, we have the land, we have the design, we want to build our own home, can you give us the financing? Of course the bank will say, well, probably not because you don't really have any assets that I can, I can lean upon in case you can pay your debts. So in the Swedish approach, they've set up a basically a national guarantee fund that says, no, 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 look, in the eventuality that these people cannot repay their debt, we as the national guarantor will make you as the bank whole. And that, that frees up literally billions of euro of investment capital every year to build these new cooperative homes for local people delivered within the needs uh, and with respect for the local environment. Another issue which is key, and, and we've skirted around a few times today, but I'll go more directly is the issue of land. We have to be very, very proactive and very careful about how we manage land, especially public land. I have a simple rule myself, which is that you should never, ever, ever privatise public land. Public land is a very scarce resource, and once you sell it, it's very hard to get it back. But if, you, if you must have public land that you're not going to use for public interest, for building public housing, or schools, or hospitals, or whatever public infrastructure you need, at the very least, offer it to someone on a lease basis. Give them a 50, 60, 70 year lease, because that way you guarantee you get a, a long-term revenue stream, but also you make sure that the person who's using the land, a private developer for example, plays by the rules that you set. Because if they, if they change, if they start um, increasing rents at both levels that you deem the team determines, then they'll be in breach of contract, their lease is over and you can kick them off the land. So you retain the power. So do not sell public land. Keep it in the hands of communities uh, who need to use it. Um, one of the big things we see across Europe now is that where land has been privatised, uh, and where there is potential to build new homes, those homes are not being built. And the reason they're not being built is that there's a huge amount of speculation. People who might buy their land, they might get planning permission to build apartments or build homes, but they have no intention of actually doing that. They're hopefully just waiting for prices to go up, and then they're going to flip that asset to someone who maybe will build the homes at some point down the road. But the intervening time, there's a huge loss of potential while that land sits idle. So I would recommend that you look at cities like Paris, for example, which have become very, very strong on the issue of vacant land at the moment. Uh, in Paris, you would be charged 17% of the market potential for, for land every single year that it remains idle. To give you that in figures, if you had a piece of land that was valued at 4,000 euro per square meter, um, at the current tax rate in Paris, one hectare of that land would, would 
you tax it about 6.8 million euro a year in terms of you not using that land. So very, very quickly you see people who, who are trying to behave in a respectable way and not build homes. You see those people get out of the market and cut their losses while they're ahead. And that land then becomes useful for people who want to build. Another way is to really control the direction of land. So I'm pointing towards Vienna. In Vienna there's an institution called the Wolf on Siena. They have many different, many different responsibilities around housing, but one of the key things they've been doing in recent years is managing, servicing publicly owned land, but also buying additional land and then offering it to anyone who wants to, to use that land, primarily social housing providers, but also private housing providers, as long as certain conditionalities are met. So, for example, there's limits around the maximum you can charge for rent. They actually have competitions between different people who want to use that land. And you have to put together a tender where you say, if we get access to this publicly owned land, here's what we'll build, here's how much the rent will be, here's all the additional services that we folded around that. So if you go to Vienna, you see all these great redevelopment zones where you have apartments that are built to a very high environmental standard that embrace things like the circular economy and low carbon approaches, because they're part of the, the way you win these bids. But they also include creches, they also include community centres, they also include medical centres. And they really put themselves into the needs of the community, not just in terms of homes, but all the services that people need to live well within the local community. Another approach, and again, if I'm just look well, rent setting is not so strictly regulated in Wales as it is in other parts of Europe, where, where, where the amount of rent you can charge is very strictly determined. What we see in Wales, but in other parts of Europe, is that people um, are benefiting from scarcity to put up rent prices, even if the quality isn't justified in terms of the rent they're charging. So in the, in the Netherlands, a huge amount of, of the rental stock is based on a point system. So based on the quality, based on the size, based on the facilities within a home, the home is given a certain number of points, and each one of those points will translate into a rent of about five euro. So basically, you cannot charge, if you want to charge top quality rents, you have to provide top quality homes. That's kind of the Dutch approach that they're taking. You cannot simply passively sit back and wait for the market to drive up prices and you, you get all the benefits. You have to invest to make sure you build good quality homes and then you can charge the rents that correspond to that. You cannot do it the way around. Another thing I would point to is properly funding the development of new social housing, especially for younger people, which could be a very important stepping stone to then maybe accessing owner occupier homes in the longer term, but at least in the short term, make sure that people have affordable homes within the local community they can access. Now, we know that interest rates are increasing, so of course accessing the capital is difficult. We know that the economy is not on a, on a strong footing as it has been in the past, so again, maybe funding coming from the public sector won't be the same as what it would be in the past. So I'll point you towards the French model. So in France, where I live, everybody has what's called a livre a savings account. It's basically just an ordinary savings account you can get from any bank, it's very mundane, but it gives you a quite attractive rate of interest that's all tax-free. So at the moment, my livre a savings account is giving me about 3% tax-free interest. Much, much higher than the current account. It's basically a way of everybody putting a few quid away every month, 10, 15 euro, whatever it might be, and all that money is pooled at national level. It's currently about 480 billion euro. And all that money is then lent out for public infrastructure projects, social housing, schools, hospitals, roads, uh, public transport, at very, very low interest rates that people need it. So it means that there's this huge, privately sourced pot of money that can be used to invest in community infrastructure community projects at a very low interest rates at a time when interest rates are quite high. Coming towards the end, uh, in terms of, we heard a lot about younger people who are being pushed out of the communities. We saw the testimonies in the videos, which again are not unique to Wales. We see the same testimonies from right across Europe. In Denmark, recognising the importance of young people getting their independence at a young age, not being stuck at home, living in their own childhood bedroom. They've specifically built housing for young people, youth housing, which is targeting that cohort of the population. Students, young workers, people on apprenticeships, whatever it might be. People who can find a basis, a home for themselves, outside of the, of the family home, within their community, to build for the future. It's a really important thing, and it's something that's often overlooked, specifically housing for younger people. And then finally, uh, I will talk about the idea of cost-based uh, rental housing. So again, in, in Wales you have Council Housing and Housing Associations, which are largely income-based forms of housing, and then you have the private market, which basically charges whatever the private market will, will tolerate. But should there be something in between? Should there be something for people whose incomes maybe are too high, 
for social housing, but too low for market housing. Well then yeah, there is. It's called cost-based rental housing. It's a new approach which has been developed in Ireland. It's kind of an intermediate form of rental housing uh, for, for these kind of people who are caught between the market and the, and the public sector. And basically, as the name suggests, you build homes, you build apartments, and then they're offered for rent at cost price. So whatever it costs you to, deliver, to give that home to that person for, per month, that's the rent is. There's no profit taking. It's literally just providing homes at cost price, not at market price. So it's the cost of delivery that dictates the rent, not what the market will tolerate. So again, it's about de-linking rental properties, particularly for younger people, people on middle incomes, from the market. Bring it back towards a community approach, bring it back towards an approach that makes sense for people having money in their pockets and moving on with their lives. So, there are just a few small number of policies that could be invented. I could honestly talk to you for a week and not really have good, good policy ideas. That's the benefit of my job. I get to travel all over Europe, talking to interesting people like you, attending great events like today's event, and learning from what's been implemented in other countries and what's possible. So, I'm not saying that this is a blueprint for Wales, but it's just something to get the ball rolling for you to think about. And of course, myself and my colleagues were more than happy to continue this correspondence. This is the beginning, this is the beginning of the, so the end of the beginning, not the beginning of the end. So, as we say in Ireland, Gurmina Mahagut, or to use the local vernacular, Diak on Thank you.